Hey everybody, Connie Knox with Genealogy TV coming to you uh, from my car as I drive to work uh, this morning. But I wanted to share with you that I just finished last night editing a three-part series on census records. And originally it was going to be one uh, longer video, but it turned out that I felt it needed to be broken up into three parts. So part one is about the 1790 through 1840 census. Part two is about the... Uh, 1850 uh, to 1940 census and part three is a strategy about how to find your family uh, prior to 1850 when you can't find uh, family members names only the head of households so I hope you enjoy those coming up first is part one enjoy the series Hey everybody, Connie Knox here with Genealogy TV with a special episode about census records. So we're going to get started right now. All right, so the U.S. federal census records were taken every 10 years. And for genealogy, if you're not using census records, you should be. Uh, the U.S. census records for genealogists is kind of the backbone of your research. Um, you must be using census records. Population schedules are going to be the most beneficial for you. And there are several uh, other records uh, that are available as well. And those are non-population schedules, the Indian schedules, um, the agricultural schedules. There's some slave schedules. But for today, we're going to focus mostly on uh, the population schedules. So the schedules, these U.S. schedules, if you never, if you're new to genealogy and you've never used the U.S. federal uh, census before, um, you're going to find this to be probably one of the most valuable resources that you have in your uh, toolkit. So the U.S. marshals and later on they called them census, uh, they used uh, just enumerators, census enumerators would walk door to door and they would document each family group. Now, in the early census records, they only documented the name of the head of the household, and then later uh, they added all names. So we'll go into each one of those here shortly. Um, information was provided by various people. It wasn't always the person at home. Sometimes it was a neighbor. So keep that in mind. So if we take a look at, I'm going to transition this over so you can see it a little bit better. If we take a look at this, in this case, it's a 1920 U.S. population schedule. You can see that we have James Jones, his wife Minnie, and Gertrude and Kenneth, their daughter and their son. It gives us um, their a column, and this is the 1920 census, but we're going to dig into all of the different variations here shortly, but uh, here we have the sex of the person, male or female, uh, color, in this case white, um, and the age at last birth, in this case, uh, excuse me, age at last birthday, in this case uh, he is, uh, excuse me, he is 33, she is 25, they have Gertrude, their daughter is 5, and the 2 over 12 means that this person, Kenneth, the son is two months old. Of course, the children are going to be single at that age. Uh, this particular census shows the place of birth of the person in that line, but it also shows the place of birth of the father. In this case, I found this one interesting. James Jones, his father was born on the Atlantic Ocean. That's the way I read that. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it looks like to me. Um, and then... The mother and her parents are both born in Ohio, um, and the children, of course, are all born in Ohio, except for the son is born in West Virginia. So that's kind of a quick, quick and dirty look at that census record. So if we move on to my next slide here, there is a reason for this. Um, one of the things that I want you to pay attention to is the month of enumeration. This is really important because if you're trying to estimate a person's age, 
or when they were born, what year they were born, the month of enumeration is important. So if you'll notice here, the early enumeration uh, schedules were, okay, let me back up just a minute. We have census schedules from 1790 to present day, but only available to us because of the Privacy Act to 1940. So the numeration month on the early schedules were in August, in 1830, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80, and 90 were in June, actually in 1900 as well, were in June. In 1910, it was in April. In 1920, it was January 1st. 1930, it's April 1st, and on to present day has been in April. So the reason for that is, if a person is listed as, say, seven years old, but he hasn't had his birthday yet, it'll make a difference when you're estimating the uh, birth year. Because when the enumerator walked around, whatever the birth year was at that time, whatever the, excuse me, the age of the person was at that time, is, is going to determine what year he was born. So... I hope that makes sense. Um, so it, it, it's important to note on each record that you're working on what the enumeration month and day was at the top of the schedule. So here we have, I'm going to make this a little bit larger so you can see it, uh, the U.S. federal uh, census locations, places you can find the census schedules. So the archive.gov and these are um, uh, research census. You can also, these are, um, a lot of these are free resources. Um, Ancestry.com, familysearch.org. You can also find it on microfilm in a lot of the major libraries that are good for resources. And also make sure you check out US Gen Web. Um, they have good information there too. And so, um, We'll go into this a little bit more in, in a moment, but a lot of these uh, resources are for free. So the U.S. Federal Census was done, like I said, every 10 years. It's available from 1790, uh, 1790 to 1940. 1950 census will be available in 2022. So with each census record, with each enumeration, more and more information became available. And so uh, in the early records um, up to about 1850, um, the, the only listed, well, actually up to 1840, they listed the uh, head of household. And then a lot of times it was just a count of how many people there were. And the census was created literally to count people. Uh, that's what its intention was for. So uh, it was not expected at the time to be a genealogical resource. So uh, we're grateful that it is, but uh, <laughs> so that information available every 10 years, beginning in about 1850, we start getting a little bit more information. Um, so I highly recommend that people um, download the blank forms. And there's a reason for this. You can find free copies of the blank forms for every uh, year of the census from 1790, 1800, 1810. I recommend you download them all. You can find them at Ancestry.com. You can find them at FamilySearch.org. And you can find them at Archives.gov. So I'm going to put the links to those in the show notes at the bottom of underneath the video here on YouTube. And then you can download those directly from those links. There's no obligation, no cost. They're all free. And so those are our resources for you. So moving on. Oh, these are the actual um, uh, locations for the free downloads. And uh, if you want to uh, freeze the video for a moment and, and write those down, you can, but I will put these links in the show notes uh, for you below. So one of the things you can do is click on, uh, go, go to the National Archives, which is the archive.gov um, website that I showed you a moment ago. And it's also listed here on this slide. 
Uh, there's free resources available um, at this location for all the different years and places. Uh, see the National Archives for a listing of when and where the records are available. And I'm going to show you that because it's really kind of cool. Okay, so at the National Archives here, you can see where you can click here on the uh, census information and you can open up each one of these windows and learn all about the different I love the 1880 census I don't know why <laughs> but that's the one that I always uh, play with um, but it shows you exactly it shows you where you if you have to pay for it if you can get it for free this says uh, ancestry.com has it for free at the any uh, National Archives and Record Administration computer otherwise you have to pay for it by subscription but Family Search has it for free if you have an account so uh, if you don't have an account at uh, Family Search it doesn't cost you anything I am not uh, an employee of Family Search but I'm just saying you probably should have an account there because you can catch a lot of records there uh, for free. Taking you back over here, you can also uh, see various resources for those uh, schedules. You can also see that there's federal mortality schedules here we're not even really digging into today, but um, there are lots of, of resources. Even the 1940 schedule is up here looking for oh there's the blank form okay so other resources shows you the blank form that you can download that's just another place to find it so the name of the head of household for 1790 through 1840 only listed the the names of the head of household and then it listed how many people were in the household in various age groups so those also changed slightly through the years uh, so for example here, the 1840 census, I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see it. The 1840 census uh, in this example shows uh, free white males. And each column has these different age groups. So under 10 years of age, of 10 years of age and under 16, of 16 and under 26, of 26 and under 45, of 45 and upward. Okay. So if we look and see what that might look like, this is an example of the 1790 census. And as you can see, it is really kind of hard to read. Um, and this says free white males of years and up, oh, of 16 years, no, of, <laughs> see, I can't read it, right? So this is why, I advise you to download the schedule. The blank forms give you the ability to read the the titles, the headers on the on the page because quite honestly it's a cheat sheet, right? So if you're also back in the day we used to use these forms when we went and pulled the microfilm and we sat at the microfilm reader and we would fill in these forms um, to to help us uh, document what we found in microfilm. And then later, <laughs> this is dating me, later we were able to get copies of those microfilms. So, you know, I've got these giant copies of microfilm. Now everything's online, but I still believe in the forms because those headers are invaluable. And that gives you the ability to really read what this says 16 and up including he uh, heads of families so if we go back to that other slide now we can say oh yes that's what this column says and uh so that really really kind of helps us uh with our research especially in those early years now you got to keep in mind those early years weren't even written in books there was no forms there was there was uh you know, this is an example of the 1840 form, but there were no forms. They just put it on any piece of paper they had. They were told what columns they had to have and how they were counting uh, the families. But the reality is uh, there was no forms back in the early days. So uh, those are examples of the forms that can help us with the headers. Now, those headers 
change over time. And, and the reason I'm pointing this one out, and I know this may even seem hard to read, but each one of these columns um, begins to change. For example, this first one says under five years of age, of five years and under 10. So they're now broken these down, and these are males, by the way, and then we've got females over here. And this, by the way, this whole section here is the left-hand uh, side of the page, and this is the right-hand side of the page uh, for the 1840 federal census. And again, this is just a form I downloaded off of archives.gov. But as you break this down, you can see this one says of 20 and under 30. So they're breaking down the age groups, and they are literally putting in these columns the head of the household's name, and then they're putting tick marks as to how many people are in each age group. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed part one of the federal census record videos. Coming up next is part two, um, taking us from 1850 to 1940. So enjoy part two of the U.S. federal census.